So this is everything that you're going to need to make a lavender sachet out of your finished cross stitch piece without using a sewing machine. So I see a number of tutorials around for all kinds of cross stitch finishes. And then I also see a lot of people saying, yes, but I don't have a sewing machine. I have one, but I don't know how to use it. I have one, but I'm afraid to use it. Or if you're like me, I have one and I'm perfectly capable of using it, but it's out in my craft studio in the garden and sometimes it's raining and I just want to sit and sew something on the sofa in front of the TV instead. So I'm going to show you how I would prepare my cross stitch piece for hand sewing, which is slightly different from the way I would prepare it if I were machine stitching. Um, I'm going to show you everything that you'll need and then I'll show you a little bit of how I would then actually stitch it and uh, show you the finished product. So first of all, this is my cross stitch piece. Uh, this was one that I started following a kit. And then if you've seen one of my recent floss tube videos, you'll know I went away, I wanted to stitch on it, forgot the pattern. So I just made up this center section, um, but it's a square pattern. And I think it's about four and a half inches square. And I think it'll make a really nice lavender sachet. The next thing I've got is this. Let me see if you can see that uh, nice and close. So this is cording which I have made. Now, I used Vonna Pfeiffer's most recent tutorial for making cordage, but uh, I started off with some chenille thread rather than standard six strand embroidery floss, which is my, why mine looks a little bit different. But I think that'll have a really nice texture. You don't have to make your trim. Obviously, you don't have to use a trim at all. If you want to make a hanging ornament and you're not going to use a trim, or your, the trim that you're using isn't suitable for the hanger, you'll also need some ribbon as well. I'm going to use my trim uh, both to go around the edge of the ornament, uh, lavender sachet, and also to make the hanging loop. You'll need, let's move those out of the way for the moment, you'll need some backing fabric, you'll need some iron-on fusible interfacing. Uh, light to medium is, is absolutely fine. Um, it's not really for strength in this case. I'll explain what it is for as we get to use it, but you will need some. Uh, you'll need, if you're making a lavender sachet, obviously you'll need some lavender. If you're a domestic goddess, maybe you've grown yours in the garden and dried it and now it's ready to use. If you're me, you will have bought yours from Amazon. Um, and then you'll also need some scissors, a ruler, a pencil, needle and thread, ordinary sewing needle, not a uh, cross stitch needle. If you've got a rotary cutter and a, a quilting ruler and a cutting mat, absolutely use those. I'm assuming that you've never done this before and therefore you probably don't have or necessarily want to buy a lot of specialist equipment for this. So basic things you can do this with uh, ordinary scissors, ruler, pencil. I would normally use better scissors than this, but I have lost my nice dressmaking scissors. So anyway, these will be fine for that. The other thing that you will need that I have not yet got out, but I'm just going to show you here. Uh, this is my ironing mat. It is just a thick wool felt mat. You can buy these lots of places. Craft stores will have them. Amazon has them all over the place. Um, it's very portable and convenient, but an ironing board is absolutely fine. And then the thing which I haven't yet got out is my iron. And that is what we're going to start with is some ironing. So to begin with, I'm just ironing my piece of fabric that I'm using for the backing. And what I've done is I've put my cross stitch piece underneath that so I can iron that, but not directly. So I'm gonna put the backing fabric out of the way and then this is my main fabric. Now what I'm gonna do is take my ruler and my pencil, and I'm gonna do this in inches, but obviously, if you prefer to do it in centerpiece, you can. So you can see my finished piece, that's the naught, and that's four and a quarter. Now I think four and a quarter is just a little bit too small. I think I'm gonna finish it at four and a half. Maybe four and three eighths, what would that be like? Um, there. Four and three eighths. 
no, four and a half, four and a quarter, four and a half is what I'm going for. So that leaves me just about a quarter of an inch um, on either side of the fabric. And I'm going to just mark that with the pencil. And it's fine. Don't worry about the fact you can see the pencil mark. You won't when we are finished, I promise. So I'm going to do that both ends and then I'm going to turn it round and do it in the other direction as well. And actually, I'm glad I've done that because for some reason this looks just slightly longer. It's possible, so it's exactly the same number of stitches in each direction, it's possible the fabric is not precisely evenly woven in each direction. So that gives me a little bit of a border on either side. And then I'm going to join up those lines. And again, I'm not worrying about them being visible later. If you are worried about that, you could use um, one of those special sort of fabric pens that disappears in the air or with heat. Um, and that would work fine as well. Now, I'm doing this because I have made a mistake. I don't know if you can see it, but I can definitely see it. See that? I'm now looking. I'm like, where is it? Where is it? Um... Yes, I know where it is. Okay, so here you can see there's a little open hole in the cross. Here there's a little open hole. Here there's a little open hole. Here there's no little open hole. So I noticed that a while after I stitched it, I hate unpicking. I really hate frogging. So when it's just one stitch like that, and I know I'm going to do an interfacing on the finish, I'm just going to come back in later, unsnip the top strand of my floss, take it to the back and pull out the floss that I've now unpicked, if I can find that. Sorry, I don't think you can see this, but I also, I can't see to do it if I'm not uh, directly underneath it. Let's have a look. There we go. Okay. So that uh, is the one I've just unpicked. You see it's got a hole there. On the back, it's got like these tiny little ends of thing. There's nowhere enough to sew those in, but it's fine because any minute now I'm going to interface on the back of this and that will be enough to hold those little strands of floss. So I don't do it as I'm stitching. I wait till I'm about to finish it. Then I take out the extra stitch, bring the ends to the back, and interface them to hold them in place. I wouldn't do it for something that was going to get a lot of usage. Like if you were making, I don't know, a project bag or a tote bag or something like that, that was going to get a lot of use, um, I, I probably would either leave it or try and do it properly. Uh, but for this, I think that'll be a perfectly fine fix. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut, and you can measure this if you like, but I'm just going to eyeball it, um, sort of, half an inch to three quarters of an inch outside the lines you've just drawn. Okay. You can do this very neatly or you can do it not very neatly and it will not matter at all, I promise. So you can see I am not taking the trouble to do this brilliantly neatly. Okay, scrap bits of fabric there. Okay, next thing I'm going to do is use this to measure the piece of backing fabric that I want. So I want this to be exactly the same size. You can see this is a piece of fabric that's left over from a shirt that I made. Um, I think we'll do it down here. Okay, and I'm gonna cut that just using the piece of linen from my cross stitch as the guide. And again, this doesn't have to be super precise which is my favourite kind of crafting. I'm really not good at precise. I never have been. I, um, fun fact, uh, my uh, first degree was in physics. I once got four out of 10 in a GCSE physics practical that was about measuring skills. Yeah, precision is not my thing. So we've now got two pieces that are basically the same size. We're going to cut our interfacing. And I think for this, because this backing fabric I've got, I don't know if you can see, it is quite lightweight 
and it's a little bit see-through so I'm going to interface that as well if you've got a much sturdier like a quilting cotton or something like that you don't really need to interface the back on this particular project so you remember the size of the square that we drew here this was four and a half inches square okay both directions just quick check I'm going to cut two pieces of interfacing that are also four and a half inches square. Okay, I've got an enormous piece of interfacing. You, you obviously don't need very much. You can buy much smaller amounts than this, but because I also do dressmaking, making, I sometimes need quite big pieces or quite oddly shaped pieces. So I don't really like to cut mine up more than I need. So here again, I would recommend, and if you've got a ruler that has a T-square on it, or if you've got like a quilting ruler, you can see I'm just going right to the edge because I'm mean about this kind of thing. Uh, if you've got a quilting ruler, something like that will help me make sure you've got a perfectly square square, then use that. Um, I am just checking that is fine. It's not absolutely critical that it's perfectly square, but you, you do want to try and make a pretty good go of this. You probably want to try and take slightly longer over it than I have done. And like I say, um, if you've got rotary cutter, quilting ruler, all that jazz, now is your moment to, to get it out and cut nice straight squares. Right, backing fabric, stitched piece, interfacing, fusible interfacing, has uh, two sides to it. And I don't know if you will be able to see this, but you should be able to feel one side is slightly rough. And if you look at it carefully, you can see where the little spots of the glue are. And the other side is smooth and, and sort of feels a little bit fuzzy. And you want to put the glue side, that is the rough spotty side, down. And the smooth side, that's better, there we go. Remember this was not completely measured square, so you want to make sure that the thing goes on the right way, okay? And then you are going to uh, cover those with a piece of fabric. I'm just going to use the leftover of my backing fabric. Uh, or you could use, like I say, a tea towel. Uh, if you've not got a steam iron, you'll definitely want this to be damp. Okay, so I was just saying, if you don't have a steam iron, you'll want this to be a damp piece of fabric. I find with a steam iron these days, I really don't need to bother with that step. Okay, you just check the instructions for the interfacing that you've bought. Um, mine. There we go. You can see steam coming through. And you don't want to iron this exactly, you want to press. So hold it still and press down. And that just means that the interfacing is much less likely to move on your fabric and actually glue in the place where you've put it, which is what you want. That's why you put it there. So you do this um, and it'll tell you to do it for ages and probably you don't need to. So I'm just going to take this off and just check and you can see that's all stuck in place. So what we are now going to do, we're just going to give those a moment to cool off because we're going to continue ironing and I don't want the heat of the iron to then be um, undoing the work we've just done, sticking down the interfacing. And in fact, what I'm going to do for the next stage of this ironing process, I'm going to turn the steam off. I might put it back on just at the end, but I'm going to turn it off just for the moment. Okay, thing I didn't mention that you might find useful at this stage, pins and or, you know, the little quilting wonder clips. I've got some pins handy. I'm not going to go and look for wonder clips at this point. Pins are completely fine, but wonder clips work nicely in this situation as well. So I'm going to start with the backing because then it's less of a worry if this goes wrong. 
And all I'm going to do here is I'm going to fold along the edges of the interfacing square that we just uh, attached and press it in place. And I'm going to go around the whole square and this is quite nice because it's got stripes on the fabric so you can see that you're keeping it all in line. Press it in place. And you should just about be able to feel as you fold upwards the ridge where the interfacing starts and use that as your guide for where your fold line should be. Okay, and now I'll fold that to the front, turn it over to the front. You've got a nice, neat back. Now this is, you see, where it's different. If I was doing it by sewing machine, I would not press it at this point. I would just stitch and then I would trust my stitching as I turned it inside out to hold it in the right place. We are not going to stitch this from the inside. We are stitching this as it will be in the finished piece on the outside. So I'm going to do the same again now with my stitched piece. And this time what I want to just do is make sure I fold it so that my pencil line is just showing on the inside. And that way it won't be showing on the outside. Okay, so let's do that and see if I can show you. There's a little pencil mark there, a little pencil mark there, and the line in between them. Press. Keep going. Pencil mark there. Um, the pencil marks are definitely helpful on this because um, generally your fabric that you've stitched on, whether it's Ada or linen, is likely to be just a bit thicker. And so therefore the um, interfacing, you can just about feel it, but it's, you know, where I've used lightweight interfacing on this, it's not, the ridge is not nearly as noticeable as it was when I was doing the backing fabric. Okay, and again, let's turn that over and check. We're happy with that. Okay, I'm not happy with this. Apparently I've completely missed. I don't know if you can see. I've completely missed this pencil line. So I'm just going to do that one again. And what I'm going to do is fold it out and press and then fold it back where I actually want it and press. If you don't fold it back out and press, you'll find it will just default to the original pressing line. Okay, that's a little bit further in than I wanted, but I think it will be fine by the time we're finished. Okay, so you can see one of the things you get when you do this, one of the things you get when you do this um, pressing at this point is nice sharp corners. So let's put your backing fabric upside down, our cross stitch fabric on top. If we've done it right, they should line up neatly. I have got a little bit too much fabric on this edge. So again, it's not hard. I'm just gonna take that out, press it open and press it back, going just slightly further in. Okay, you don't want to do this like a hundred times because eventually your fabric will fray, but you can definitely do it a few times just to make sure you get it right. Okay, don't worry at this point about the fact you've got little bits sticking out of your corners and little bits fraying around the edges. That will all be fine. You can start stitching with it like that, but actually it is sensible if you possibly can to pin it or to clip it. If you're going to clip it, definitely clip it at the corners. Um, yeah. So I'm going to pin it at the corners first. Making sure, oh, sorry, you can't see what I'm doing. Making sure I'm tucking in as much as I can, but again, not worrying. One of the great things about hand stitching is that you have loads of time as you go round to fold and refold and tuck in and make sure everything ends up 
exactly where you want it. You don't have a machine going at its own speed, getting carried away. So corners lined up. It will slightly distort the fabric, but it should be fine. Just pull out and then I would put in a pin at the centre of each side as well. OK, don't worry at this point about where am I leaving a gap? OK, again, we can leave it pinned all the way through. And it's just as we're stitching, we'll decide where we're going to leave our gap. OK, pull it flat. Just hold it with your fingers. This is a nice symmetrical pattern, so it's really easy to see where the middle is. Do you see how it looks like it might not fit? But as soon as you pull it taut, I think it's just because, um, well, it's partly that the pin's slightly distorted. So if you clip, you probably won't get that, but also because the top fabric is a little bit heavier weight than the bottom fabric. So now we are all ready to sew. So I'm gonna move you away from the ironing station and we'll start again with needle and thread in a moment. So this is the uh, pieces we've been just working on it with the backing and pinned together. And we're gonna start sewing. So I'm just using ordinary sewing cotton. This is some very ancient coats sewing cotton. My grandparents used to run a shop that amongst other things sold haberdashery. And when they closed the shop in, I think it was sometime in the 1990s, there was, you know, they obviously sold some of their stock and got rid of it. But also my grandmother, who also was a crafter, not a lot of sewing, but, you know, she would sew on buttons and stuff, did a lot of knitting and crochet, um, kept quite a lot of the stock. And then when she died, quite a lot of that came to me because not very many other people in my family would uh, have a use for that, sadly. Anyway, right, I'm just looking for a suitable sized hand sewing needle. Oh, that one's bent, so we won't use that one. Right, hopefully you'll be able to see this. So I'm using my thread held double. Let's see if you can, yeah, I don't know if it's going to focus. Anyway, I am holding my, using my thread held double and I'm going to use the loop start, which some of you may be used to doing. Uh, in your cross stitch pieces or oh, I might need to go on with a slightly bigger needle size that was not threadable by me there we go I'm really rubbish at storing my needles in a way that you can then find the exact needle that you want they're all just in together I do just about manage to keep my cross stitch needles separate because they are not sharp um, but otherwise I'm not very now let me tell you what I'm planning to do with this and this is therefore how I'm going to start. I'm going to hang mine uh, from a loop at a corner and I'm just going to choose which corner I want. I think I want it like that. So I'm going to leave this end where I'm going to hang it open while I stitch and that will be where I use to put the lavender in and uh, I'll show you how I'm going to add the trim and the hanging loop as well up there. So I'm going to start stitching about here. Am I? No, I'm going to start stitching about here. If you're right or left handed, you will find uh, there's a particular way that is easier of going. So I'm going to start and I'm holding it together exactly as it is pinned. And this is why I'm glad I've got the pin in the middle as well. And I'm going to start, oh, this is a little bit tricky with the camera stand in the way and I've also just realized I've got the wrong glasses on so I might have to go and get some better glasses I'm at the stage where uh, I've always been short-sighted and I'm now also long-sighted and I have two pairs of very focals one of which is slightly better for short sight and one of which is slightly better for long sight and neither of them are, are brilliant so I'm just seeing my loop start there nicely and neatly. And then what I'm going to do, I'm not going to do a whip stitch. Remember, this is your outside. And so this is how you are going to see your thing. I need to be looking at the actual thing, not at the camera. I'm just going to take a little straight stitch, a um, few millimetres through the backing fabric. Apologies, that's all sorts of cables and things 
clanging in the background. Okay, and then where I've come out from the backing fabric, I'm going to go in directly opposite into the front fabric and again take a little stitch a few millimeters along okay and i'm going to keep doing that so the stitch oh it's suddenly gone a different color on the thing anyway the stitching is almost all under the fabric on alternate sides and the little bit that is left is just going between the two now you'll do this for a bit and make sure you tug it so that you can't see uh, very much. I'm going to do a few more stitches um, and then I'm going to go and do the rest of this off camera because goodness me, this is harder than I thought. Stitching with a camera between me and the fabric. Also, obviously, it's catching, the thread is catching on every single pin, which normally I can manage it to make it not do that. but. The extra trick of having the camera is making that harder. Okay, so the goal is that this will be as neat as it would need to be if you are not going to add any trim. Now, I am going to add a trim, and so I know that is going to potentially cover up any issues with my seam. But you should be able to sew it neatly enough that it will not matter if you have a trim or not. Right, yours will be a lot easier to manage, like I say, because you won't have a camera to keep worrying about. And I've done something funny there. Oh, okay, I've just got my thread caught in itself, honestly. Right, I think I am going to have to take this off camera. I hope that that was clear enough for you to be able to see how you are making your stitches. I'll try one more time. And then I really am going to give up and... No, apparently I'm going to give up now because my needle has come unthreaded. I'm going to go and stitch the rest of that. We're going to stitch all the way around uh, the rest of that side, the next two complete sides, and then the final side again to come up about an inch and a half, inch and a quarter, something like that, uh, from the corner that we're leaving unstitched. If you are not doing a hanging ornament, you may want to leave the unstitched part in the centre. It doesn't matter all that much, to be honest, when you're hand stitching. I think it's more important when you're machine sewing. So, But you could leave it on a straight seam. I'm leaving it on a corner because of uh, the way I plan to finish this. So I'm going to finish stitching that. I'll come back and show you the last little bit and how I finish off. And then we'll talk about uh, filling it, trimming it, adding the hanging loop. Okay? Uh, I haven't finished stitching, but I remembered I was just going to show you what I do when I get to the corner. So you can see on this corner, I've got a little bit that's folding out and it's absolutely fine. Um, all we're gonna do is as we go round, I'm just making sure I'm sewing so that the bit of fabric I'm taking is from the bit that I uh, want to be on the outside of my cushion, cushion, pillow, sachet, whatever. So I don't know if you can see here, that's where I've got the two, there we go, two levels of full fabric. So I'm making sure I put my needle through the outer layer and pull the stitch tight and keep going till I get right to the corner, doing the same thing. There we go, through there. I might just do the stitches one at a time at this point. I had been, you know, as I go along the straight part, I do two or three at a time usually. Get right to the very corner make sure I do a stitch at the corner, one little stitch, so that that point that we've made with the iron doesn't get lost. And then as I stitch this bit, the same thing, I'm going to make sure I stitch through the outside on both sides, and I'm just going to sort of tuck that in and pushing it in with my needle. And as I stitch, I'm going through the outside on the back, the outside on the front, so the folded bit that's on the inside, I'm just ignoring. Sorry, I've slightly moved the camera out of the way and I have to keep checking that you can still see where I am, which is, to which the answer is probably no. 
And then do you see, I'm just going to tug that stitch so it's nice and tight and it will come in over the top of the folded in bit of fabric and you'll still get a nice neat edge. Similarly, if there are little bits of, sorry, if there are little bits of frayed fabric, I mean, you can just cut them off if you think, yep, yeah, they're nowhere near anything dangerous or you can just tuck them in as you go. And you see, you've ended up with a really nice, neat uh, corner and it looks perfectly fine around the edges as well. You can maybe see a little stitch or two, but barely. Um, so that's how you would do the corners. So I have stitched all the way around from here, these two corners up here and up to, you can see where my needle is there. And I think it's looking pretty good. Um, I am just gonna press it at this stage. So I've come back over to my uh, pressing board and I just put the iron on. Let's just move this. So you don't... Okay, don't know that that really helped. Anyway, I'm gonna press it. Then I'm going to fill it with the lavender. Then we're gonna uh, sew up the rest of the hole and I'm also gonna tuck in the loop, the hanging loop that I'm going to use. And then I'm going to attach my trim. But I hope you can see, even at this point, if you needed to leave it just like this, or if you pull it really tight, you can just see where the seam is. But if you just have it like this, it's a neat seam. There's a little bit showing just around where I've tucked some of the ends in, but not really a whole lot. Um, the stitching doesn't show. And I'm just, as I say, I'm just going to iron it. I'm going to do it from the back as usual. And avoid what I'm exactly doing, which is hitting the iron into everything. There we go. I don't know how people do this better than me. Obviously, they think about it and practice first. Anyway, nice hot iron. I'm gonna go around all the way, and then you know. I think those are seams that really you could be perfectly happy with. And I, I think 90% of that is in the measuring, although you can see my measuring is not perfect, and measuring the interfacing and the pressing before you stitch. So you know what the straight line is that you are stitching along and you're not trying to do any of the turning over at the same time as stitching your fabric sits where it wants to. Okay, right, I've got my lavender here and I'm just gonna go and get one more thing to help with that. This is my funnel that I use. It looks really mucky. That is just from the crushed walnut shells that it normally lives in the bag of. I don't mind if bits of that end up in my lavender, so I'm not going to worry about cleaning it off. I'll then stick my funnel into the hole that I have left. bigger angle on this that's a bit better and then I'm going to take this is my lavender I'm going to take a scoop of that good okay so mine has got enough lavender in it I'm just going to put the pin that I had taken out of that corner back in now I am going to take my cord that I made, cordage that I made from the chenille. It actually, the colour matches better than it looks on camera. Um, the, there is a difference, but it, it's better than it appears on the camera. So anyway, here I've got a knot, and then this was the loop that I used to hold it. I was just going to say, actually, I did use Funnel Fifer's most recent tutorial, but I do not have any of the equipment that she used. I don't have a clamp, and I don't have a winder. You can do all of that. Uh, you know, like if you're doing it a lot, which I assume she is, um, I'm sure it's worth buying the kit. If you're just doing it occasionally for short lengths like this, honestly, it was completely fine to do it by hand. So I made a loop at one end of the fabric, which is what she held with the clamp. And I just um, hooked my loop around a chair, but you could hook it around a doorknob or, you know, anything which is in a fairly sturdy spot that's going to hold it in place and then I just twisted instead of using she's got a little manual twisting machine I literally just twisted between my fingers finger and thumb 
and it was fine. So don't watch that video and think, oh, well, I haven't got the kit and I don't really want to buy the kit. I can't possibly do that. Now, you can see I've just pinned this around and it's really just to get an approximate length. Um, as I stitch it on, um, that might change. But I want to know where the end is going to be. And I'm going to tie a knot. So that would take it around to my end. I'm going to give it another inch and a half just in case. And then I'm going to tie a knot there because the other end of my cord, so one end just had a knot and I cut it off at the knot. This end didn't have a knot. What it had was all this masking tape nonsense. And I don't want to put that inside my lavender sachet. So I'm going to tie it off securely with a knot at the point where I know I've got enough length, wherever that knot was that I just tied. It must be somewhere here. There we go. Give it a nice secure knot and then chop it off after that. I am going to, I know it's the right length, so I don't need to leave it in place. I'm going to tuck that end in. I'm going to stitch all the way along this seam to where that is and then stitch securely through that. Then I am going to make my hanging loop and stitch again the other end of that loop securely. Then I'm going to stitch around the whole thing, stitching the trim on. I'm going to come back to this end. This bit is still open. And when I'm nearly at that end, I'll be able to tuck this part in and stitch the whole thing in place. I'll show you while I'm doing it. OK, but that's where we're at now. Right, so I've taken it to the corner and I've given it a little stitch in the corner. I'm going to take my trim. And remember, we've still got a hole here, so I can tuck that in right up to, push it right up to where the corner is. And I'm going to take a couple of stitches through the trim all the way from front to back to hold that in place. Then I'm going to leave my hanging loop. So I don't think it needs to be huge. I'm Mine is, I don't know, two inches maybe from top to bottom, something like that. And I'm not going to tuck the bottom of the hanging loop into the inside, but I'm just going to do it so that it kind of twists over at the bottom. And so then again, I'm going to stitch through the trim through the fabric and out through the trim at the back. And I'm going to do that two or three times to secure that in place. Now my trim, because it's this chenille, it's very forgiving. And so I'm not bothering to change the colour of my thread because I know that as soon as I pull my stitch tight, it will disappear. The white of the thread will disappear into the chenille. So this is what the corner looks like at this point. And then I'm going to take this bit of the trim and start stitching it down the edge of the fabric. Now, this is where if your stitching is not completely perfect, your trim will do you all the favours in the world. And you remember, you want your front to be the front. So I'm just going to lay my trim sort of on the front and then... Again, sort of, it is a whip stitch, but do make sure you think about having most of your thread hidden behind the fabric and just a short little bit of thread here. So I'm going to take a short stitch there and then a long stitch across. I don't know if that shows at all what I'm trying to explain. Okay, let's see if we can pull it from here. I've literally got the camera between what I'm doing and what I'm talking about. It's quite difficult. Right, and now my threads just need to pick up. There we go. I'm going to need to change the thread again in a minute. Okay, so I'm keeping my trim towards the front and stitching from the back. I'm bringing my needle in sort of directly down from where it is, but then I'm pushing it along before I catch the trim again. 
so that there's only a tiny little stitch and it will mostly disappear into the trim. Obviously, you would sensibly uh, use a thread that matches your fabric and or trim at this point. If you're doing a different kind of trim that's less forgiving, that's even more important. But like I say, with the chenille, I think you can basically get away with it. Okay, straight down, a little bit across. And then. So this is where I'm at. I have to say, stitching this trim on has not been as straightforward as I thought. This is not to do with the lack of sewing machine. This is to do with my... Well, I don't know if it's just me or if it's the chenille, but the cord is not as cord-like as it might be. So it's a little bit rough and ready and you see it sort of slipped out in various places. It's fine. It's not quite as neat as I had hoped it was going to be. Anyway, so this is where I'm up to. So you remember we did the hanging loop. I'm just at the end of this and I've reached the bit where it's still open. So... Um, this is a good lesson, by the way, and why you should always cut things a bit longer than you think you're going to need. I had left a good inch, inch and a half uh, extra here before the knot. And as you can see, as I've stitched around it, um, I don't know whether I left a slightly longer hanging loop or whether I've just, um, you know, not quite pulled it all. Anyway, I've got just enough. So that's good. So I'm going to tuck that end into the hole. Sorry, my um, my left hand is having some issues at the moment and I don't have great feeling um, in the fingers. So it's easier if I do stuff with my right hand. So I'm going to tuck it all the way in and then pull it round and then just pull it out so that it will cover that last bit of the seam. So you want all the ends inside and the trim on the outside and I'm going to have to add in a couple of extra twists just to make this is what I'm not sure about the chenille whether it just doesn't hold the twist very well or whether I just didn't do it very well now so I'm going to do that I'm going to pull it out all the way along to where this ends and then when I stitch I'm also just going to stitch a couple of bits holding that in place and I'm going to stitch this um all in one stitching the seam and the trim together but I might go back and forth a couple of times just to make sure that's all in place uh, if you want to put a clip there to hold it while you stitch you could do that if you want to put a pin in to hold it while you stitch you could do that okay but you remember how we twisted this over so this is my front part of the thing and that's what I'm going to just stitch to make sure it covers so the whole thing is joined up so we're nearly there and I'm going to just keep doing that final little bit of stitching and then I'll show you the finished article. Okay, and I've finished all my stitching, so I'm just going to turn it over to the back. And you would do this, obviously, at any point where you needed to uh, end your thread. I always like to start with a loop stitch if I possibly can. So to end the thread, I'm just going to take three small stitches, really small. You can hide them under the chenille if you're using that kind of trim and then what I like to do is just plunge my needle sort of as far as I can into the piece pull the needle off the thread and then here put it slightly tight you can even push it down with your scissors snip the end off and the end will just disappear into the middle of your pillow so you don't have any end here and that way if it does come loose there's a bit of thread left for it to play with and so then we've got our hanging loop and our finished lavender sachet um, and I think that looks really nice I think if you didn't do the trim it would look really nice um, if you did a different kind of trim you could do a rick rack um, you know or a beaded trim or anything like that um, but the seam is strong enough and neat enough without thread now you can see a little bit on the back where I was struggling with my cord and I probably should have changed the color of my thread um, so if I'd used a matching sort of pinky mauvey colored thread you would see that a lot less and also if I had been dealing with better cord I think I could have made a neater job of that but I really think um, that you need not think 
because I don't have a sewing machine, I can't do a neat finish on my pillows. You could do this a stuffed, you know, really well stuffed pillow. You could use it with uh, fiber fill, with walnut shells. What I would say is if you, I mean, however you're stitching up, if you're using walnut shells, you do definitely want to put the interfacing on or use a lining fabric because the very fine grains of the walnut shell can come through the holes in your cross stitch fabric and that's a bit rubbish um but there we go so uh that is my no sewing machine stitched pillow lavender sachet tutorial and i'm really pleased with it i wish you could smell it it smells delicious <laughs>